Good morning, all. I uh, was a little bit delayed because it showed on my screen that the signal was kind of fading in and out. And the last time we had that problem, it got very choppy, and I think we ended up losing a lot of people, and it was just a bad deal. So recognizing that in while it's happening this time, uh, I decided to jump back off, make an adjustment, and then come back on. It seems like it's doing okay now. So hopefully you won't have any problems and that we can move forward with our day of encouragement and um, all will be well with the technology. Uh, today is Thursday. Always happy to be with you every single day and glad for those of you who are willing to take the time out of your day to share a bit of encouragement, to share uh, the word of God and uh, not just hear it or be entertained by it, uh, but to internalize it and then act according to it. Good morning, Sandy. Good morning, Rinda. Always happy to have you here. Marie, I don't know if I've given you a proper credit uh, for helping out with making masks, but uh, thank you for that. And uh, I have benefited personally from that. And uh, one of the other ministers that I know in the city of St. Louis is doing uh, a mask program where they're going to be making masks for those who are in um, convalescent homes. And I mentioned uh, the fact that you and Donna were so good at uh, these masks and um, I might prevail upon you to get involved if they ask that of us. So uh, thank you for your kind service. We appreciate you. Good morning, Pasha. How are you doing? Hope all is well. We continue to be in prayer for you and for your family, your son, CJ in particular, Tom Cole. And I'm sure that the lovely Catherine is with you as well. Uh, but today we're, we're going to be talking uh, from the point really of a question. And that question is, are you ready? Are you ready? I know Sophia's ready. She's jumped in and so has Janice. Good morning, ladies. Glad to have you. Um, are you ready? And if you've got your word, and I trust that you do, I'd like for you to meet uh, with me in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, we're going to start in verse 14. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Um, so again, are you ready? Question mark. <laughs> we're all familiar with the concept of preparation, of being prepared. That's uh, important, obviously. And it means different things, family, to different people, uh, particularly as it relates to the subject matter. There are those who prepare or get ready for a rainy day. There are those who prepare or get ready for a project or assignment that is due. Paris is upstairs right now, toiling away, uh, trying to get the last four weeks of her college career concluded uh, and just doing these assignments before their deadlines. So preparation and being ready means something different to her. Uh, retirement, you know, there are those of us who are getting close to the age where we need to start thinking about the next phase of life and so, what things are we doing to be prepared for retirement? Uh, those things are important. Alice, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, and then, of course, there are even fables that we have that we grew up with as children. Uh, you recall, perhaps, the, fa the fable of the ant and the grasshopper, where the ants were always toiling and working even throughout the summer, where the grasshopper was taking his leisure. And then come winter, the ants have everything that they need and they're comfortable, and the grasshopper is cold and begging. We, we remember that story from when we were kids. But what is the concept of readiness and preparation as it relates to Christianity? That's what we need to talk about today. And so I would share with you, and you know me, I'm big on context. As we look to examine today, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 29, if we were to go back to Matthew chapter 24, all of that chapter talks about being ready. The first 14 verses talk about signs to look for that are indicative of Christ's return. Uh, the next 14 verses talk about the perilous times that will precede the return of Christ. Verses 29 through 30 reveal what the actual return will look like. For the Bible says, they will see the Son of Man appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, etc., etc. It goes on. So after that, we see the parable of the fig tree. Now, there's a couple of fig trees that are mentioned in a couple of different parables. But in this particular one, um, the lesson is looking for signs 
for things that are to come. If you see the leaves that are the way that they're supposed to look during, preceding the harvest, then you know that there will be fruit soon, that type of thing. All this keeps with it the same theme of preparation, preparation, preparation. And then this gives way to chapter 25. And chapter 25 begins with the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. You know, the ladies who had the lamps that were full of oil and those who were not. And when the bridegroom came, those who didn't have oil went, go, went to go look for it and they ended up being left out, right? And so the whole point was be prepared, be ready. So then this brings us then to our point of focus and encouragement for the day. And that is the parable of the talents. Now we're all familiar with the parable of the talents. Um, we've read them. Uh, we, we understand what it is, but you know, again, the whole purpose of us getting together uh, at 10 o'clock, Monday through Friday, is for encouragement. And we're taking our encouragement from the word of the Lord and we're examining the word of the Lord. We're unpacking it. We're going into detail about what it says and extracting meaning uh, that we can utilize in our day-to-day -day lives. And so that's what we're going to do today. Now, one of the things that I would like to share with you up front is that the parable of the talents um, is not just about passively waiting. Right? So you get yourself ready and then you just wait. No, it's not about that at all. But it's of responsible activity producing results which the coming master can see and approve. All right? That's worth saying again. Being ready isn't just, about, you know, it's interesting that I've had some conversations with some people here recently and just talking about whatever God has for me next. Uh, and the idea is, and I tell people this, I said, I'm not just sitting on the couch waiting for whatever he has for me to show up at the door like it's an Amazon delivery. You know, there's things that are going on. There are things that, that, that have to be accomplished, things that need to be done. And so that's the point of this parable. It is not about passively waiting, but of responsible activity, producing results, which the coming master can see and approve. And I'd like for us to kind of think on that, have that in the background of our minds while we are exploring this passage. Is that all right? Is that okay? You guys ready? All right, fine. So let's get into verse 14. Verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25 says, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. I am using the American Standard Version of the Bible. Some will say servant. This one says slave, so I'm going to read what it says. All right. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. And to another one, one. Each according to his own ability. And the man went on his journey. He gave them... He left them, went on his journey. Now, the English has one meaning for talent. Typically, when we think about talent, we think about somebody's skill or ability or uh, unique way of accomplishing a task. You know, you, you've got a talent for singing. You've got a talent for organization. You've got a talent for photography, Sophia. Um, and so we think of it in those terms. But in the original Greek, we're talking about a sum of money, like we might call dollars and cents and stuff. Talents were a weight, but they were also a monetary denomination. So it's important for us to understand the context of what is being said here. But for the purposes of interpretation of this particular parable, we should think of it more along the lines of privileges and opportunities of the kingdom of heaven to be faithfully exploited before the master returns, as we sort of previously indicated, okay? The idea is, is that it could be thought of as unique gifts, abilities, or circumstances, opportunities, right? Given these things, because again, a parable, if I have not shared this with you before, comes from two Greek words, para and balos, which mean to lay alongside of. Uh, more contemporarily understood, it's referred to as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus is telling them a story that they can identify with in order that they would understand something higher, right? So 
as we look at the parable and as we examine it, we need to think of it in terms of the message that's actually being given. And what's being given here is an idea of, of us, us, you and I, personalize it, being given abilities and opportunities to produce for the kingdom, for the master, for the one who has provided us with those opportunities. Okay. All right. Now, notice also, because he gave one five and one two and another person one, that these talents will differ. Not everybody gets the exact same thing. In fact, when you take a look at the scripture, it says that he gave those uh, each according to his own ability. We don't all have the same abilities, right? If, if we did, I mean, what ability would we choose? <laughs> you know, perhaps we would be entertainers and winning Oscars. Perhaps we would be athletes and winning Super Bowls or World Series or Stanley Cups. We all have different abilities. And so what this is saying is that the talents have been given according to the abilities of the individuals. But I'll tell you this, the expectation of what they do with the talents is the same. We'll get into that in just a few moments. Now, verse 16 goes on. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. I don't want you to miss this. Verse 16, immediately. Once again, immediately. Master drops you off, gives you the talent, says, I'm out. And immediately, this one goes to work. What does he do? He trades his talent and he gains five more. He produces. That's what we in the corporate world call return on investment. All right. Now, what we can see in general is that these were clearly trusted servants, trusted slaves. And they were very close to the master. Again, he had gone from wherever it was that their base of operations were, and he had left them someplace. Uh, not only could he leave them alone as he went away, but he could do so with the expectation that they would accomplish the things that they were designed to accomplish. Right? His purpose. And not only that, he could leave them confidently with something of value. It's important that we not miss that. He, the master left them with something of value. Now, we could get into what that is. I could tell you that five talents, without getting into all the details, was worth thousands of dollars in today's money. Thousands, right? That you're giving to a servant, a slave, and asking them to be responsible for it. But I want you to see, once again, the application of the point that different sums were given to different slaves according to their ability. Man, you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? As we saw that, I mean, he had some abilities in the beginning with regard to his dreams and the interpretation of dreams. But as he was put into a lot of unfortunate situations, a lot of situations that he didn't deserve, nor were they of his own making, we began to see some things about him. We began to see some ability that he had. He was an administrator extraordinaire. You know, whether it was in Potiphar's house um, um, or in the jail, uh, certainly that led to opportunities for him in the kingdom of Egypt, where he was made second to the, to the king, to Pharaoh, all because he had these amazing abilities that others just did not seem to have. And so that's just the way life works sometimes. We all have different abilities. Um, you know what? I'm going to save some time and not expand on that. I tend to go off into stories and examples, and so I won't do that with this. We'll just move on to verse 17. Where the Bible then says, in the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. So he said in the same manner because the person who had five gained five more. The person who had two gained two more. Verse 18 tells us that he who received one talent, though, went away, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, we're all familiar with this particular passage and we know how it ends but if we were to stop there as if the story was being related to us the first time I wonder what we would think I wonder what we would think if we knew that one person went out and made some money and the second person went out and made some money and the third person went out and 
prevented the loss of some money. In other words, he was offering, he was, he was securing the money. So the guy, uh, who knows what can happen out here? Uh, I could get held up. I could get robbed. Um, I could make a bad business deal and could show up with nothing. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want him. I don't want to have him come back and find me with less than what he gave me. So what I'm going to do is go somewhere into a hidden area, dig a hole and secure it. Right. Make sure it's safe. Make sure that no one can get to it. And that when the master returns, uh, I'll be able to say I provided great stewardship for what you have given me. Right. By making sure that nothing happened, that making sure that you are not diminished. I wonder if we had no knowledge of this particular parable, what we would have thought of what this one did. Well, we know the direction it's going to go. But I think that there are a lot of us who kind of hang out with contestant number three. I think a lot of us don't want to lose any ground, don't want to make any mistakes, don't want to cost anything. So we sit, right? We just sit and wait for the master. I don't want to, I don't want to mess anything up. I'm just going to be right here and I'll be right still until he comes back. And everything is going to be just as he left it. And I believe a lot of us live our Christian lives that way. But what we'll see though, is that this third contestant number three failed to recognize the point of why he was trusted. <laughs> Again, you had to be really trusted to be on this trip with the master and really trusted to, to, to have access to these funds. He failed to recognize the point of why he was trusted and assigned. Now, verse 19 says, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. A couple of things that just jump out at me and I hope jump out at you. This is sort of the way that I study. I look at these words, I look at what's being said and I ask questions. First thing I see in verse 19 is now after a long time. I'm wondering, why was the master going a long time? I mean, I'm not necessarily curious about what he was doing or necessarily where he was going, but you know, you had three slaves and normally you want to keep a pretty close eye on those, but you left them and you left them with money and you were gone for an indeterminate amount of time. You were gone a long time. And that gives people the opportunity to do a variety of things. There are other parables that we can read about people saying, they, well, he, he didn't come back and so they didn't start abusing people and started drinking and doing all these kinds of things. Yes, that kind of stuff can happen. So why would he be gone for a long time? Mm -hmm. And the other thing was settling of accounts. Settling of accounts reveals that this is a financial expectation and a financial transaction. That's what settling accounts is. He left them with money. So when he comes back, he calls them together for the purpose of discussing what went on with the money. That's settling of accounts. But this whole long time that he was gone, that's interesting. That's interesting. Now, what we can do, if we were to put the Lord in the place of the master, he died 2,000 years ago. And we have been looking for his return ever since. And he hasn't returned yet. Despite the predictions of some who says he's going to be back on May the 8th. 1934. Book it. Sell your belongings. Jesus is coming back. And then he doesn't. Right? Why doesn't he come back? I don't know why he doesn't come back, but I can tell you why those people were wrong. Because even Jesus says, listen, I don't know. That's God's business. <laughs> and that's not going to happen until he does. And so any prediction about when he will come back uh, is a bad business to get into. Nevertheless, he will be back. That's what this is telling us. He'll, he, he will be back. And it has been a long time. Every generation has felt that Jesus was going to return in their generation. We feel based on the things that we see that perhaps it'll be now. Who knows? But the point is to be ready. Whenever it is. Nevertheless, he comes back after a long time. That takes me back to verse 14. When I emphasized this at the time, the first slave acted immediately. Remember that? Verse 14. And immediately he went out and traded and got five for the five that he had. 
right? So now he's got 10 immediately. Why did he do that immediately? So he'll be ready. That's why. He did not know when the master was coming back. The master never said, hey, I'll be back in 30 minutes. I'll be back in 30 days. I'll be back in 30 months. He never said. But it's clear that that first one knew what the expectation was. He didn't drop us off here for nothing. He didn't give us this money for nothing. It's my understanding that we're expected to make him some money. And I'm not going to, I don't know when he's coming back, but I want to look good. <laughs> I want to do what a faithful servant should do. Make him some money. And so he did so immediately. Now, what he did after that, I don't know. How long it was, I don't know. But I do know that he was ready. Verse 20. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, well done. Good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. Right? I always, I, I have that in a lot of things that I say, well done, my good and faithful servant, right? That's what we want to hear when we're at judgment, when the Lord comes. We want to hear those words. That's where I get this from. He says, you were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Hey, happy, happy, joy, joy. Notice the words. Well done. Notice the words. Enter into the joy. Notice the words. I will entrust you with many things. See, that's all. That's reward. That's reward. And that's what we as Christians are looking toward. We want to please the Father. If you were with me yesterday, you remember me talking about how glad I was when my dad was happy with me. Uh, and I said a couple of particular things, and so I've received that back in feedback and email. So thank you, you guys, for paying attention. <laughs> Everybody's telling me, there you go, leave. Right? Uh, but yeah, that's what we want to do. We want to please the master. We want to please the father. We want to make sure that he is happy with us and the things that we have done. And so the, 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 the news is all good. I would, I would encourage you to notice also that uh, both these guys received the same thing. Joy of the master, more responsibility. Right? And so as we, family, go through our Christianity and we go through this life, when we produce the things that are expected of us, we can look forward to the rewards that Christ has for us. We're all going to be able to receive those same things. There may or may not be different measures, but you know, there is one heaven and we all desire to make it our home. <laughs> and, it, you know, we don't want to press the metaphor too far about, you know, who gets what and, you know, maybe you live in a higher level of heaven. You know, it's not about any of that. Let's not press that metaphor uh, too far. Now, verse 24. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, <laughs> this is going to be good, right? I knew you to be a hard man. You're the type who reaps where you do not sow. You're the type who gathers where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and, and, and I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, see, you have what is yours. This that you gave me, I have protected it. I have kept it. I have hidden it to make sure that you suffered no loss. And now I'm here to return it to you safe and sound, just like you gave it to me. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow. You knew that I gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least put my money in a bank and on my arrival I could have had interest, something more than what I gave you. I would have received my money back with interest. And so what the master did is he says, therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. See, there's further reward. 
But in order to give somebody else more reward, that's going to cost somebody. Somebody who didn't do what they were supposed to do. Brother Wilkins, you see what I'm saying? Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 28. You see, he knew what the expectation was. He knew. He said, he confessed with his own mouth. I know you're a hard man. I know you gather where you don't reap. Right? But what he did instead of trying to make money, and it's not about money, but what he did rather than trying to make the most of the opportunity and most of the talents or whatever, how we phrase this in order that we can understand the point of it, he didn't. He hid it. He buried it. He did nothing. He sat. He waited. And it didn't go like he thought it was going to go. How could you know those things about the master and not act accordingly? How could you know, family, that Jesus, when he comes back, is going to be looking for fruit? That's, that, that's why we were given seed, to plant and to water. God has an increase, but you know what? That planting, that watering is our fruit. We're supposed to produce. We're supposed to share the word of God. That's what we're supposed to do. And there ought to be somebody, somebody who comes to know Jesus because we introduced him. And so if Jesus comes back looking for an accounting, if he looks to kind of come to settle accounts with us, are we going to have anything to give him? <laughs> are we going to be able to say, Jesus, I, I know you know Sarah, but I, I just would kind of like to make a personal introduction uh, because I wanted her to know you and she agreed to meet you. And so I want to put you two together so that when the accounting comes, you can say, well, here's Sarah. Here's John. Here's Eric. Here's Millie. That's what this is. This man was criticized as lazy. Are we? You see, the credit and the trust that he was given was taken away because he failed to meet the expectation. And so I want you to know, family, that there... There's consequences for us failing to do the things we're supposed to do. Now, I'm not telling you that as a downer. Uh, and I'm not doing anything that Jesus didn't do. Jesus told us these things because these are things that we need to know. And I'm simply telling you what he said. Verse 29. For to everyone who has more shall be given. And he will have an abundance. Right? There's the good news. There's all the incentive that you need. But, but, from the one who does not have, even what he does shall be taken away. And, and here's where it gets really scary. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't know about you, family. I don't know about you, church. <laughs> I have no interest, no business, no belongings, in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I am more interested, more at home, more comfortable and more desirous of the place with the gates of pearl, the streets of gold, and the rooms and the Father's mansion. And so if I want to make one my home and not the other, I know that I need to be ready. <laughs> and I know that being ready also means producing. These are strong statements being made regarding the basis of salvation and condemnation. And, and I want you to understand this fully, please. We all know that faith without works. And so a dead faith is no faith. No faith at all. And where are you going to go without faith because the bible tells us without faith it is impossible to please him and if you're not pleasing him you have no place with him cut and dried simple so if we find ourselves yet unready we have time i can't tell you how much time i can tell you that tomorrow is not promised i can tell you that you have today but if you find yourself short in the accounting, get busy. So I ask you the question again. Are you ready? You may have a different answer now than you had in the beginning. Are you ready? 
if Jesus were to come back, if the master were to come back from his travels today and call for an accounting, are you ready? Readiness consists of having already faithfully discharged our responsibilities as disciples. Whether they have been small or great, we are to faithfully carry out the roles entrusted to us, whatever they are. If God has entrusted you to make masks, then make masks. If God has entrusted you to be an encourager to others, then encourage others. If God has entrusted you to teach the word, teach the word. And God has entrusted all of us to go out, according to Matthew chapter 28, and make disciples. Baptizing them. Teaching them. We're all entrusted with that. We need to make sure that when... He arrives. We are ready. And I want to tell you this, COVID-19, prime time. I keep telling you every day, this is prime time because people are seeking. People are looking. They want answers. They want relief. They want to understand what's going on. They want God. Whenever there's times of trial, tribulation, people look for God. And we are the ones who know him. So let us be ready. And I'll leave you with this. I'll leave you with this. Remember verse 14. If you don't remember anything else today, remember verse 14, that when the master entrusted the slave with the talents and left him, he immediately went out. Immediately. And you know what that says to me? It says to me, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. <laughs> Is that all right? If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. That was the problem with the, the, with the, the parable of the uh, uh, wise and foolish virgins. Those who had the oil were ready. Those who didn't have their oil were not ready. And then when the bridegroom came, they had to go and get ready. And that cost them their opportunity. Family, thank you. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. God bless you all.